So last time we introduced the, the maximum entropy uh, formalism for reasoning with uh, uncertainty. And um, I mean, maybe we go back to the example and uh, yes, so yeah. In this example, we had two binary variables, A and B. So the, uh, the joint probability distribution consists of uh, four numbers, uh, three of which are independent. So we really need to have these uh, three values in order to answer any probabilistic query about this domain. Yeah. Um, but the amount of information we had in this example was only two. So we only had two out of three necessary values. And then, I mean, if we then write down the equations, we see that we get three equations for four unknowns. So we have an underdetermined linear system. Huh? And I mean, if you look into linear algebra, if you have typically, if you have an underdetermined linear system, then uh, you have infinitely many solutions. Huh? And then you can pick one out of these infinitely many solutions, and that's the situation here. Huh? So. I mean, you might say, okay, this is a nice situation because now I can pick an arbitrary out of these infinitely many solutions. Um, but yeah, what, what was my argument last time? Why it's not good to pick one of these infinitely many solutions arbitrarily? Why is this not really the best idea? So he says we then would get kind of a random answer to our query. Yes. But it would be an answer. At least it would be an answer. Huh? But it would be kind of random. Yeah, maybe let me say it in my words. The thing is that by your random choice of a solution, you would put ad hoc information into the system. And this is not good. I mean, that w that's like, if you know nothing, then you can say, okay, let me assume my coin falls heads up. Huh? But this assumption is not valid. I mean, it's, this is like putting information into the system which is not there and this is not allowed. Huh? And therefore um, it is not allowed to just take one of these infinitely many solutions. What Max End does is it looks for out of these infinitely many solutions for the solution with maximum entropy and entropy measures the degree of uncertainty. So out of these infinitely many solutions, I take the, the one with the highest uncertainty, or in other words, with the lowest information contents. So of course we have to kind of put some information into the system in order to um, to get a definite solution, but the amount of information we put into the system has to be minimal. 
that's the point. So we have to put a little bit into, but not more than this. And the principle of maximum entropy does exactly this. Yeah? And uh, I mean, Claude Shannon in the, I guess it was in the 1940s, uh, he proved that this entropy function is to a constant factor the only function that measures what we think of information should be. Yeah? Okay, so and we applied it to this example and got uh, some results. Um, yes, we also talked about indifference. So um, from this maximum entropy mechanism we can conclude that for some special cases we don't need to solve the Lagrange equations. Uh, in, in a case, for example, if a set of variables is indifferent, uh, and what does indifferent mean? Indifferent means that um, the Lagrange equations, they are um, invariant under permutations of these variables. That means if I exchange two of these variables, then the Lagrange equations, they don't change. Uh. If this is the case, um, then we can immediately um, assume that all these variables must have the same uh, value. Uh. Um, and so in such a case, it's much easier to solve the problem because we just set all these variables to be uh, equal. Okay, yeah, and uh, okay, I gave you this exercise to solve the Maxen problem without any explicit co uh, constraints. Without any constraints, that means we know nothing. Huh? So we just know nothing and we want to determine um, a distribution with these n values p1 through pn and the result is they all have to be equal and have to be uh, 1 over n. I mean this can immediately be concluded from this indifference theorem. If a set of variables is indifferent and of course if I know nothing about my variables they are indifferent um, and then I, c I can immediately conclude that they have to be uh, equal and that this is the uniform distribution. But of course this is not the purpose of the exercise to just use uh, indifference. In the exercise you really have to write down the Lagrange equations and solve them. Uh, and you will see that you will get this result. Okay, yeah, and in the case of two variables, then of course this uniform distribution, all the elementary events have the probability one fourth. And for example, we get P of A is equal to P of B, <coughs> which is one half. P of B given A is one half two. Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Now we, we look at a, a further example, a next example and here we assume the only knowledge we have is this conditional probability P of B given A is equal to beta. No? Um, and uh, so I hope you remember that when I introduced um, the, the conditional probabilities in this context, we were talking about implication rules like A implies B. Uh, so if I know A, then what do I know about B? Uh, or now, I mean this in, in classical logic, this tells me if I know A, then I know B. Uh, if A is true, then B is true. Uh, um, and this is the probabilistic extension. Uh, so this tells us 
the probability for B given A is beta. And now we can uh, uh, we can uh, get a formula for P of A and B which is using the product rule and uh, so this then is beta times P of A. Uh? Okay, now um, uh, yeah, let's see where do we have this? Yeah, here you see the the four different probabilities, and this is P one, this is P two, P three, and P four. Uh, so maybe we should write this down. P of a comma b is equal to P1, P of A comma not B is P2, P of uh, um, not A comma B is P3, and P of not A not B is P4. Excuse me, where are we? Yes. So P of A comma B is P1. So this is P1 is equal to beta times P of A. So it's equal to beta times P1 plus P2. Huh? Because P of A is the sum of these two. So we can write down this equation and now if we uh, bring this to the left hand side oh let me see no we bring this to the right hand side then we get this equation now. And also, of course, we have the normalization condition, so we get these two equations. And now, we just have to, um, to write down our Lagrange equations for maximizing the entropy. And if you do this, I just omit it here, if you do this, write down the Lagrange equations um, and try to solve them, it's not so easy anymore. Last time, we could do it symbolically and we could derive a nice solution, but here the Lagrange equations, um, they are nonlinear again and there is no symbolic solution. No? So the only way to solve the problem is to solve the Lagrange equations numerically. No? And uh, so I did this and what we get as a result is this uh, figure. So here on the uh, horizontal axis we have P of B given A. So this is our conditional probability which is given. So this is actually the, the, the value beta. And now here we have um, four curves for P1, P2, P3 and P4. So P1 is P of A comma B. So maybe we look at this one. P of A comma B, that's the curve we get. Huh? Um, and maybe we look at, the, at some extreme points. So here, for example, P of B given A is zero. So that means the probability for B given A is zero. If this is zero, um, then um, P of A and B, which is P1, is zero too. And that's quite plausible. No? Um, is that plausible? If P of B given A is zero, 
Yeah, then uh, P of B is zero. And then of course P of A and B is zero too. So, but I mean, we could also look at this formula. P of A comma B, which is P1, is beta times P of A. And if beta is zero, that's what we have here, then of course the result is zero. So this is easy to see. Yeah? Um, now look at this other extreme point here. P of B given A is equal to 1. So if I know A, P of B um, is 1. Yeah? And now the result is, what, what we get here is one third. 0.33. Um, Why is it one third? Oh, yes, I mean, yeah. So what we get for P2, if P uh, of B given A is 1, then P2, which is P of A comma not B, this of course is 0. Huh? Because if, if B is true, then not P is false, and that's why we get a 0 for this one. Huh? And all the other three parts, so, so this one is zero, and these uh, three remain. Um, and uh, P of B given A is one. Yeah, so these three, they get the same value, which is 0.33. But why are they all the same? Yeah, so actually, I don't see it at the moment. Yes, but we can see it here from these equations. If you, if you put beta equals zero, then we get a zero here and a zero here, and we get P1 is equal to zero, okay? So we get this equation, P1 is equal to zero, and we know the value of P1. Now if we put this zero in here, then the only remaining equation is this one, and you can see that P2, P3, and P4 they are indifferent. And if they are indifferent, they need to have the same value, which is one third. Okay, yeah, so that's why we get uh, one third for all of these here. And this, at this other extreme point, uh, we get the, the point three, three here. And, uh, yeah, what's quite interesting is this point in the middle here, too. If P of B given A is 
And what does that mean? That means I know nothing about B if I know A. And then all four variables are indifferent. So that means all these four events have the same probability, which is 0.25, one fourth. Okay, so much about these results. Oh yes, um, um, okay, and, and one more thing is, which is very important. We have no symbolic solution here. And that's why, I mean, we are doing artificial intelligence, so finally we want a computer to do the work, to, to compute the results. Um, so there is no symbolic solution, that means our computer needs to have a numeric algorithm, which in, for any arbitrary cases can always solve the problem, but then we only can have a numerical solution. Okay, now let's look at this example again. So what's given here is P of B given A. And this is in, in logic the correspondence to the implication. So if I know A, then I know B. And here, if I know A, then I know B with a probability of beta. Now let's look at this in, in such a truth table. Uh, uh, here we have the variable A, which is binary, B, which is binary. This is the so-called material implication from logic. And this is just the truth table of the implication. Uh, um, let's look at this truth table. So if A is true and B is true, then the implication is true. If A is true and B is false, then the implication is false. And the interesting cases are these here. So if A is false and B is true, then the implication is true. Huh? And if A is false and B is false, the implication is true too. And Maybe you have some intuitive problem with these values. I don't know, maybe you have a problem or you don't have a problem. It's up to you, actually. Uh, um, but now let's, let's look at this, at the probabilistic formulation. Here we have P of A. Uh, so, um, and we, we look at these extreme cases where the probability is either zero or one. And, and these cases, of course, correspond to the logic, uh, uh, logical model. Huh? So we have probability one, 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 zero, zero, one, and zero, zero. Huh? Um, now, if these, uh, uh, both probabilities are one, then, of course, P of B given A is one. Huh? If I have this case, probability of A is 1 and probability of B is 0, then P of B given A is 0. And in these cases, P of B given A is undefined. Why? Let's look at the formula, at just at the definition, um, P of B given A is P of A comma B divided by P of B. And now here you see what's, uh, what happens. Um, P of B is in the denominator. So if P of B is zero, then this expression is undefined. And that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. If I... Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Excuse me. What's wrong here? What's wrong here in this formula? Yeah? In the denominator, yes. Thank you. Okay. So you see this expression is undefined 
if p of i is equal to zero. Yeah? And that's this case here. If p of i is zero and p of, one, p of b it doesn't matter, then p of b given i is undefined. I, do not, I know nothing about the probability for b if a um, uh, is, is false. Huh? I only know something about the probability of b if p of a is not zero. And look, these two cases correspond to these two cases. And I mean the only thing we can say is p of b given a is undefined in these two cases. But what, what Boolean logic does is put a truth value here which is uh, true. I mean in, in formal logic, in uh, digital circuits, this is all okay. But if you do common sense reasoning, then uh, it doesn't make sense to put some values here. It's just undefined if p of a is equal to zero. So if a is false, if a is false, then I can make no conclusion about b by using such a rule. And that's actually what we do in common sense reasoning. So from this we can see that using a probabilistic calculus is much more appropriate for common sense reasoning than using, for example, uh, propositional logic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now we can, as a next question, we can, for example, ask what value does P of B given A have if only p of a equal alpha and p of b are given. So we again, out of our three required values, we only have two, which are these two, uh, and we can answer what happens. And then we get these three equations for the four unknowns. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe we should uh, skip this uh, this example, yes. Uh, this is just another example which we can skip. Um, let's talk about uh, an implementation of this mechanism. I already said we cannot implement it symbolically. It would be nice, but we can't do it because our nonlinear equations cannot be solved symbolically all the time. So in many cases we have to do uh, numerical solutions and there are actually two systems uh, both um, coming from German universities one which is spirit is, uh, it comes from the Fernuniversität Hagen um, uh, it's in the, uh, in the group of Pro Professor Bayerle and Mrs. Kern Isberner they, they developed this system and the other system comes from Technical University Munich um, and it was developed by uh, Dr. Schramm in his uh, PhD thesis and they both um, are of course based on numerical mathematics uh, so the system I know very well is uh, uh, PIT PIT stands for probability induction tool um, and it uses sequential quadratic programming. I mean sequential pro quadratic programming in short SQP is an algorithm for, f for, um, for optimizing functions in n-dimensional space. But this algorithm uh, it's not channel. Um, why is it not channel? So it does not work for any function yeah, because um, the problem of optimizing arbitrary functions in uh, n-dimensional space is not computable. They, uh, so, and that means 
there is no general algorithm for optimization problems. And that's why uh, n-dimensional optimization is an intractable problem. It can be solved by algorithms, so it can be solved formally only for cases. And this sequential quadratic programming um, is an algorithm that finds an extremum for, um, I guess it works um, if the function to be optimized is convex. And this is actually the case for the entropy function. You remember the, the, the graph from last time? It's a really convex function which has one isolated extremum, even in n-dimensional space. Yeah? And now the, quest, uh, the problem arises from the constraints. I showed you an example. If the constraints are nonlinear, then there may be many extrema. And finding the highest of these maxima is possible by this SQP algorithm, uh, which uh, PIT uses. Uh. And this PIT system, there is one, one of the exercises is that you uh, shall use the PIT system to solve some um, probabilistic reasoning problem. Um, yeah, and maybe I, I just show you, um, yeah, um, yes, so this is the, the, the web interface of the PIT system. Um, you find it on pitsystems.de and if you go on, on this PIT systems page, then you click on, um, I think, the PIT interpreter and then here you go on blank page and then you get such a blank input window and here, in such a window, you can enter your problem statement. And that's what we see on the next slide. This is such a uh, very little uh, input file uh, with one of our examples. You have to declare the variables, so that means the variable A has the values T and F, uh, standing for true and false, and B too. So we have two binary variables, and this is P of A equal true is 0.6. So that means P of A is 0.6, P of B given A is 0.3, and now, I mean, this is, this is our knowledge. Here we have two constraints, so that means that gives us two equations um, and of course the implicit normalization condition you don't have to write it. Uh, so we have three equations for our four unknowns. Um, yeah. And here you can state a query. This Q means uh, I want to know the probability for B. And I also want to know the probability for B given A. Huh? So that's how such an input file looks like and now you can state any problem. And input into, uh, into PIT. And you will then get an answer. And now if you look at such an input file you can immediately see the big disadvantage over what we did before. What is the problem that we, uh, we have here? It's a problem we always have when we numerically solve a mathematical problem. I told you this last time in the math lecture. What is the big disadvantage of numerical computations? Uh, yes, this is one problem. You only get an approximate solution, but this is not such a big problem. So if we get a solution with, uh, let's say, six or eight decimal places, that's by far enough we need in AI. 
So this is not really a severe problem. The bigger problem is, what is the bigger problem? The bigger problem is these numbers here. Look, before in my examples on the slides, I always said, suppose we know P of A is equal to alpha and P of B given A is equal to beta. And then I get as a solution a formula which tells me for any alpha and beta the result. So if I do the symbolic solution, I, I have infinitely many solutions at the same time. I know for any alpha and any beta the solution. But now here, in case of numerics, I have to assume one value for P of A and one for P of A given B. And now, if I start my pit uh, solver, I just get the solution for this combination of values. And now, if I want to know it for another combination, I have to do it again and again and again. So I would actually need infinitely many runs of the, my pit system uh, to get all the solutions, which is not possible. Huh? That's the, really, the real problem of numerics. And that's a really uh, big disadvantage. I mean, in AI, it's not that much of a problem because suppose this is part of an expert system. So uh, think of a medical expert system. You enter your symptoms, and these symptoms are like such conditional probabilities. And we, then we start our pit solver and we get a solution for our query and that's it. So we really want to have one solution for such a given set of constraints. Okay, yeah, you will experience this in the exercises. Oh yes, and it, as a result, it's not, it's not extremely convenient, but it's readable. So you will get such a tabular as a result um, and for the query uh, P of B, you get this value. Yeah? So the, the result is P of B is equal to 0.38. Yeah? And P of B given A is equal to 0.3. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah, I, I have to tell you that this notation, I mean, this uh, thing here is kind of a um, an, an arrow. So this uh, should read like P of A arrow B which is nothing but P of B given A. So the developer of this system, Pitt, he actually likes such a notation. I don't like it because this reminds of the logical implication, but this is a conditional probability, so I don't like this very much, but this is part of the PIT system, so uh, whenever you see this, this means such a conditional probability. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, we can uh, now now that we have introduced the Maxent formalism, we look at our uh, Tweety example again because I promised you that Maxent will be able to solve the, uh, our Tweety example. Okay, now we, we, uh, we give it the probabilistic formulation. P of bird given penguin is 1. So that means all penguins are birds. I mean, this is just by definition, because biologists say, okay, penguins are a member of the class bird. Um, and this is, I mean, this is some empirical statement. This tells us um, the conditional probability uh, that a bird can fly. And now, this, what we have here is an interval. 
So this means this conditional probability is somewhere between 0.95 and 1. This is an, another advantage of the PIT system. We, we, we can even be more uncertain. Huh? I mean, the first step is to go away from uh, propositional logic. So we don't have to say all birds can fly or no bird can fly. These are the only possibilities I have in logic. No, in probability theory, I can say uh, a bird can fly only with a certain probability like 99%. But maybe I don't know the probability, I just know that almost every bird can fly. Huh? And then I can specify such an interval and I can say, okay, between 95 and 100% of all birds can fly. Um, yeah. So this is something like almost all birds can fly. I mean, we could be even more uncertain and say most birds can fly and this would then maybe correspond to an interval uh, between 0.5 and 1. Okay, and uh, yeah, this statement says that uh, penguins cannot, pe cannot fly. So the probability for a penguin to fly is zero. Huh? Okay. Now, in the logical case we tried to solve before, there this statement was a hard statement too. There we had um, a 1 on the right hand side. And then uh, this would, then we would have the contradiction. So this would contradict to this. Huh? We would have a 1 here and a 0 here and this would be a contradiction. Huh? Um, but now we no longer have a contradiction because this probability interval it allows for a particular bird that it cannot fly. Okay, yeah, and now if we put this this formulation into PIT which, which looks like that. I have the variables penguin, bird and flies which are all binary and then the uh, conditional probabilities. Here you can see how you formulate such an interval. P of flies equal yes, given bird equal yes, is in the interval 0.951. And uh, yeah, this last uh, statement, and then you put this query here, and um, the answer for this query is zero. So that means um, probability for a penguin to fly is zero. Yeah. If you put a one here in this input file of PIT, then PIT will tell you uh, that your constraints, these three constraints, are inconsistent and that there is no solution. Okay, so I mean this is, this is a very important result. We see that our probabilistic logic is able to solve such non-monotonic problems, which logic cannot do. But with probabilistic calculus, uh, we can really do non-monotonic reasoning and we get results which are very close to what we expect from common sense reasoning. Okay.
Yeah, and we have seen that PIT can even work with probability intervals. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, okay, I already talked about this. Um, we can do non monotonic inference. Um, yes, and uh, it has been shown that with this maxim, max end formulation, many problems, uh, I mean, classical benchmarks, which uh, classical logic cannot solve, can be solved in a very nice and elegant manner uh, by using Maxent. Uh, and now, in the next section, we will show that Maxent can uh, successfully be applied to a medical diagnosis problem. And that's what we enter now. Uh. So I'm now talking about a project that um, we had here at this university in the years 1998 and 1999 um, together with uh, Manfred Schramm. I was actually successful to get Manfred Schramm. He was the person who developed this PIT system during his PhD thesis. Um, and he came here for two years and worked in this project. Then we had Walter Rampf, who was the the chief surgeon at the 14 Nothelfer Krankenhaus in Weingarten. Um, yeah, and uh, we, uh, we developed this system LexMate, which is a shorthand for a medical expert system which is capable of learning. I mean, this is the shorthand of the German term Lernfähiges Expertensystem für medizinische Diagnose. Um, okay. Yeah, now let's look at how LexMate works. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe, yeah, maybe uh, I didn't try it, but let's let's look at uh, where do we have the, yeah. at the web page of LexMed. Okay, so this is the home page of the LexMed system. And now if we go on uh, Diagnose PIT, oh, then you get this uh, warning message. Um, so, I mean, this is just to inform the user that this, uh, that you should not rely on this for a medical diagnosis, so you'd, you'd better consult a doctor. Oh, and now we get a database error. That's nice, isn't it? How about C45? Yeah, let's, let's try this again. Okay, yeah. So I don't know why the, the PIT uh, variant does not work, but let's look at this other variant. It uses a different algorithm but the input form is the same. Yeah? Um, oh, and how about, isn't there an English version? Oh, no. But we can, we can look at the German version. So we can input the gender, so suppose uh, the person is male and the age is between 26 and 35. And now we have uh, the four pain quadrants. So the abdomen uh, has four quadrants, which is one, two, three, four. Huh? And uh, the place where we have the appendix is in the third quadrant. Huh? So if a person has appendicitis, then it typically has pain in the third quadrant. But I mean, we can enter whatever we want. We could say we have pain in all quadrants, maybe. And uh, this is Abwehrspannung, rebound tenderness, uh, rebound tension. Maybe we have some local, uh, then uh, Loslassschmerz, we don't know. So you, can, you see, we can enter yes or no or 
uh, I don't know the value. Um, Erschütterungsschmerz, let's say yes. Uh, no rectal examination. Then Darmgeräusche, schwach. This is uh, sonography, urine, and maybe we know the temperature which is high. And the most important symptom is the leukocyte value. Um, I don't know, suppose it's high. And then we just uh, um, click the diagnosis button and we get a result. I mean here we use, a, this uses a different algorithm. And what we get as a result is a probability value. I mean this here is the likelihood, the probability for an inflamed appendix, which is 0.86. Huh? Um, yeah. And this is, of course, a quite high probability for a severe, um, for a severe illness. So uh, the surgery uh, typically would be done in such a case. Okay, so now let's get, get back to the slides. Okay, here we have the query form again. Um, and I mean with the full PIT system, the, the answer would look like this. Um, so we have four different diagnoses, which is an inflamed appendix or a perforated appendix. I mean this is the even worse case. I mean uh, this is really serious and uh, if the patient uh, is, does not have the surgery immediately, uh, he, will, uh, he will not survive. Huh? Uh, so this is a really urgent case. Um, then we have negative, which means the patient is healthy. There is some uh, non-serious non reason for the uh, abdominal pain and maybe the patient has some other disease like pain in the liver or whatever. Huh? Okay, so you get as a result from PIT a vector with four probabilities. Huh? And as you can see the sum of these four probabilities is one. Yeah. And the task of our expert system is to compute these four probabilities and we will use PIT to compute these probabilities. Um, now, if we go back to this input form, you can see that we do have 15 symptoms. Okay. And now, um, Look at these examples we had before. Before we always had two variables which were binary. So our uh, joint probability distribution here, it contains only four values. How many values does the joint probability distribution have here? Suppose all the variables would be binary then the joint probability distribution would have 2 to the power 15 values, huh? which is 2 power 10 is about 1000 and 2 power 5 is 32, yes. So it's about 32,000 different values in the joint distribution. But these variables are not all binary. I mean here we have some binary variables. This has four values. This one has two, four, six values. This has even seven values. This has I guess nine or ten. Um, and now if you compute the size 
of the space then as a result you get something like I guess like 3 million huh? so the joint distribution um, has about 3 million values okay and where do we get these 3 million values from huh? I mean remember here the joint distribution contains four values and each of these four values is one of our unknowns so there are the unknowns P1, P2, P3 and P4 now in case of three million values in the joint distribution our space our system of equations has three million unknowns yeah? so I have to solve a linear system with three million unknowns how many equations would you need to exactly solve it three million equations and I mean you, you immediately see that there is no chance to get three million equations I mean what is such an equation such an equation for example is like P of B given A is equal to 0.7 this would be one equation and in case of Lexmate I could ask the doctor for uh, such uh, propositions like P of sorry P of appendicitis given leukocyte value is equal to um, 11,500 and fever is equal to uh, sorry uh, 38.5 and so on in order to get the full knowledge I would need to know three million such equations 0.12 something like that so in order to have full knowledge and get the, the full joint distribution I would need to write down three million such equations which is impossible of course huh? due to many reasons this is impossible first reason is no doctor would have the patience to fill such a form with three million equations huh? second no doctor would know all these values the doctor would have no idea actually huh? so this is impossible and that's one reason why using max and is good here so maybe would max and would make something something good if we would enter only 200 out of these 3 million equations okay yeah oh yeah my, maybe I should say a few words about why we used appendicitis um, in this project um, yes so it was in I guess it was in 1997 around that time when I was looking for a project in, my, in medical diagnosis because I knew I knew that medical diagnosis is difficult first and it is uncertain all the time uncertain knowledge is very important in medicine yeah? uh, why because we do not have a mathematical model of our body uh, so the decisions of doctors most of the time are intuitive and uh, they always do have a lack of knowledge so I was looking for such a project I called the uh, Elisabethen Krankenhaus the uh, chief uh, of, the, of the hospital I talked to him at the phone and I explained that I'm a computer scientist and I do AI and I'm looking for such a project and then he said okay oh yes uh, so I now connect you to the person in charge of this 
uh, which is the, the operator of our PCs. And, I, and then he connected me to the operator of his PCs because he thought that's the right person uh, to talk to me. And then I knew that this hospital is not my partner. Huh? <laughs> but I mean, it, uh, that was the case at that time. Uh, computer science for them was, we need a PC to do the administration of our patient database. That's what they needed the PC for and nothing else. Huh? Okay, that was a frustrating experience, but then a few weeks later, my little son, um, he broke his arm when he rode the bicycle, and then I had to visit the doctor, and we lived close to the Fürze Nothelfer Krankenhaus, and I went uh, with him there, and uh, because I am uh, privately insured, privat versichert, uh, therefore I get Chefarztbehandlung, <laughs> um, so the, the chief surgeon uh, did the consultation of my son and then uh, I of course asked him what do you think about such a medical expert system and I asked him uh, would you have a diagnosis which is difficult huh? um, and maybe where such an expert system would help and then we talked a little bit and he, this was Dr. Rampf, and then he said, oh yes, I have an idea, this is uh, appendicitis for two reasons. Yeah? Reason number one is um, appendicitis is very popular. So they get patients with appendicitis every day in the hospital. Um, that's the first reason. And the second, it still is a very hard diagnosis. So there are so many critical cases where even the experienced doctors, they don't know whether it's inflamed or whether it's not. Yeah? So he said, that's a nice uh, and, and a good example for, for such a problem. And he also immediately was interested. He said, oh, that sounds good. Let's, let's do uh, some common project. And, and that's how this uh, whole thing started. We write, wrote a proposal to the Ministerium, and finally we got the project. Okay, yeah, and uh, so then we did some literature study, and we found out that there was some previous work in this field. Huh? There was a, um, a Professor Oman in Düsseldorf. He did some statistical. Uh, survey about appendicitis. He did not work on expert systems, but he did some statistics, which was quite Im interesting. But we also found out that in 1972, de Dombal, a physician in Great Britain, he already had developed an expert system for the diagnosis of acute abdominal pain, which was even more general than Lexmate. So it included not only appendicitis, but many other diseases like uh, gallbladder and liver and I don't know what else. Huh? In 1972, I already mentioned this, this was even uh, before uh, the famous American expert system, mycin. Yeah, okay. So now let's look about how we solve this appendicitis problem. Um, yes, so, and before we get into the probabilistic formulation, I tell you how uh, physicians uh, would do that, or would have done this in the late 90s. Um, they would have used a score. Huh? And what is a score? A score is um, such a statement like, the diagnosis is appendicitis if such a linear combination of our symptoms is bigger than a, cer a certain threshold uh, theta. Uh, so S1 through Sn are, are our symptoms, like S1 may be the leukocyte value between 0 and 50,000, and S2 may be the fever between uh, 35 and 42 something and so on. 
And of course they will be multiplied by some weights. Maybe one symptom is much more important than the others, like the leukocyte value, so they have different weights. Huh? And if the, sum, the weighted sum of all the symptoms is higher than a certain threshold, then the diagnosis is appendicitis, and else it's negative. That's what medical, uh, yeah, these guys, uh, this area is called uh, theoretical medicine, and that's actually statistics in medicine. Huh? They use such score systems. Um, but, I mean, we immediately saw that these linear score systems, they are too weak. They are too weak for complex decisions like uh, we have them in appendicitis. Because, as you can see, it's just such an if-then-else statement. If the score is bigger than the threshold, we have the appendicitis, otherwise not. Um, and one problem is that such score systems, they cannot consider contexts. And I give you an example. Um, yeah, that's what we see here. The leukocyte value is strongly coupled with the age of the patient. If the patient is a very little kid below five years, then the immune system is not uh, not yet well developed. Uh, so that and, and that's the reason why little kids, uh, so the parents have to be careful with their little kids uh, when they get an infection or whatever. Huh? Um, so that means. Or, yeah, the, the immune system in little kids is not well developed. And as a result, it may happen that the kid has an infection, but no high leukocyte value. The leukocyte value is a response on bacterial infections. Whenever there is a bacterial infection in the body, uh, so in an adult, the leukocyte value will be high, it will be increased. But with the little kids, it may still be low, even though the patient has an infection. So the leukocyte value does not react on an infection. That's for little kids. Um, and for very old people, it's the same. Very old people also may have a weak immune system, so they may have an infection, but the leukocyte value is not increased. And now le let's look at a score system. So, um, suppose our formula would then be um, W1 times the leukocyte value plus W2 times the age. And the age is a value between 0 and 100. And now, suppose these are positive uh, numbers. Then we have some number for the leukocyte value, and, and that's okay. The higher the leukocyte value is, the higher is our probability for appendicitis. But this would mean the higher the age is, the higher is the probability for appendicitis. Um, and that actually means that very old people have a strongly reacting leukocyte value. And this is not true. Huh? The, the leukocyte value is a strong um, symptom for appendicitis for people in the intermediate age, maybe between 10 and 70, but not for the young and not for the old. And, but this cannot be covered with such an equation. Um, that's impossible. I mean, you may put a negative weight here, but the negative weight would mean that with uh, the little kids, they react more than the old persons. Huh? And this is not true either, because the very little kids, 
they don't have the reaction either. So it is not possible with linear functions to, uh, to get a, a good answer for this combination. So we really need a nonlinear system. Huh? But that's what, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. That's what medicine developed classically. And such linear scores, they have, of course, advantages. They are quite simple. simple. They are, they have, uh, such scores have been published in the literature. So, and the doctors may read it in the literature. The weight for the leukocyte value is, I don't know, maybe it's 1. And for the fever, it's 25. And they just have, they just can use this formula manually, put all the symptoms in, and then they know what the diagnosis should be. That's how students in medicine learn about diagnosis. But these formulas are not really good. Okay. Um, yes. So now, how, how did we uh, model this uh, problem? Um, we, we, of course, did it with conditional probabilities, like this. Huh? Um, so we have a variable. This is the Befund variable. Uh, that's a diagnosis. And uh, this Bef4 means four different values appendix inflamed, appendix perforated, negative, and other disease. These four values. Huh? And now, such a statement could be the probability for the diagnosis inflamed or perforated. So that's actually the two severe cases. Um, so it's either inflamed or it's even perforated. So, I mean, th these are the cases where the patient really has to undergo the surgery. So, probability for such a severe uh, case, given uh, the gender is male, age between 21 and 25, and leukocyte in this interval. Uh, and now, this probability, I don't know, maybe. 0.17. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this might be um, a query, a query the doctor poses to the expert system, because the doctor he knows, okay, this patient is male, it's in that age, and my measured leukocyte value is this. And now the doctor wants to know what is the probability for the appendix being inflamed or perforated. Yeah, that's such a typical probability uh, question to the expert system. Okay, yeah. So we, of course, had to formalize all our symptoms which we have here. I mean, that's what you have already seen in our uh, input form for the expert system. Um, yeah, and now the interesting question is where do we get all the knowledge from? How does the knowledge get into the expert system? Remember, our joint distribution needs about three million different values. Where do they come from? Classically, at the end of the 20th century, in AI um, books, you could read about knowledge acquisition. You really had to um, ask the experts for all these values, which is impossible here, of course. So using only expert knowledge is impossible. And now our approach is to use machine learning techniques and uh, just exploit databases. I use a database with many patients, so that means I have many, case many cases, 
many case studies that I have seen. That's the same way how a doctor learns. I mean, of course, a doctor learns some theory during his studies, but then the doctor has to do some practical work in the, in the hospital, and after years of seeing many patients, then the doctor has experience and learned from many cases in the same way that we did in the LexMate project. I mean, our computer system learned from 15,000 patients um, that have been documented in a database. That was in the, in the year 1995. There was a, a statistical survey. All, the, all hospitals had to document all appendicitis cases in some forms and they sent these forms to Stuttgart and uh, they were put into the database. Uh, and we were lucky and got this database from the Landesärztekammer. Okay, so, and this was the primary source of knowledge uh, for our expert system. And I would have been happy if we would not need any uh, human experts because they are uh, very, there is so much noise and uncertainty and inconsistencies in the knowledge of these human experts. I don't like them. Huh? Um, so I would have preferred to only use the database. Um, but this database had a problem. Um, I mean, there was a design problem, or I would say a design error in this statistical study. Because, I mean, they had to fill in this form. It's, I mean, the form, you, you could imagine the form like, like this. The form looked like this. So, the form was for, for such a surgeon who had done the operation on a patient, after the surgery, the doctor had to fill the form and fill in what was the symptoms, the pain and so on, and rebound tenderness and whatever. It filled in all the symptoms. But it all, the doctor also filled in uh, not the probabilities, but what was it? Was it an inflamed appendix or a perforated? Or was it negative or what is, was it other? After the surgery, they know it. How did they, how did they know? I mean, they took the appendix out. They removed the appendix and then they sent uh, the appendix to the pathologist, who is the doctor, who examines the appendix under the microscope. And under the microscope, the pathologist sees whether the appendix was inflamed or perforated or neither of them. Huh? So after the surgery, they know what, uh, what happened. Okay, that's how this uh, statistical uh, survey worked. But there was a problem. And the problem was this, that the doctor had to fill the form after the surgery. What about these patients that the doctor did not do the operation on? I mean, there comes a patient into the clinic, the doctor looks at him, examines the patient, and says, oh no, no problem, go home. Um, and for these patients, the form will not be filled. So, I mean, there is this one part of the persons which are, of the patients which are more or less healthy. They will be sent home and the others, they will be operated. But we, we have no knowledge in this database about these healthy patients. So we only have a model of the severely sick patients, only of those patients who had uh, gotten the surgery. So this database is not representative. And a classical statistical uh, physician would never use this database because it's not 
representative. So any any uh, statistical mathematician would not like such a database. It's not representative. You cannot use it for such a study. Okay. But we said, okay, let's try to use this database anyway because it contains knowledge. It does not have representative statistics, but it contains knowledge. And let's use for the other half of our world medical experts. And so the decision was to build a so-called hybrid expert system. At that time, this was really an innovation, what we did there, because, I mean, this is in AI, that's the machine learning uh, world, and it's easy. We just put it into a machine learning algorithm, and the expert system comes out almost automatically. But if this is not representative, I cannot use machine learning, because then the model would be bad. No? So we said, let's use these both sources of knowledge and build an expert system. Um, and that was uh, difficult at this time because end of the 20th century, neural networks were mon one of the most favorite machine learning algorithms. And you could train a neural network based on the database, but then, I mean, neural networks, they are completely numeric there is no chance to get this expert knowledge into the neural network. Um, and therefore, we use probabilistic calculus. Yeah? Because in probability theory, we can integrate both sources of information. What did we do? We used the database and computed from the database probabilistic uh, conditional probabilities like this. Yeah? And you, I hope you know how to compute such a conditional probability from the database. Do you know? How does that work? So we have this database with 15,000 patients. How do we compute such a... Con no, let's, let me ask, how do you compute this conditional probability out of the database? Yes, yes. So you, you just use the definition of the conditional probability and count the frequencies. That's what you do. Huh? Um, and then maybe 70% of these guys with positive appendix, uh, appendix have a leukocyte value bigger than 100. Huh? Um, so that's easy. It's easy to count these numbers from the database. And this, as you can see here, this can be done automatically as long as you know which are my queries, which of the prob conditional probabilities do I want to know. And we already talked about in this, uh, in this world with these 15 symptoms, we would ideally need to know um, three million different such values. No? But this is a problem. This is a problem. It is not possible to get three million values out of a database with 15,000 patients. No? 15,000 patients cannot cover all the entries in our, um, in our joint probability distribution. So we have to be careful which values to ask. But as long as we know which values we, we want, we can get them automatically out of the database. Okay, so we get, to, we get uh, conditional probabilities. And now, um, as I already told you, from the database we can get a model for the uh, for the sick patients, a model about these guys with appendis, uh, appendicitis positive. Huh? But we cannot, can, cannot get a model about the negative patients.
because most of them uh, have been sent home and they are not part of the database. And that's why we said, okay, let's ask such questions to the expert. So we asked Dr. Rampf, please give me the probability for a leukocyte value bigger than 10,000 if the patient is negative. And then the doctor would say, oh, that's an extremely small probability, like uh, less than 1%. And then we entered such a value less than uh, 0 0.01 into our system. Uh, and that's how we built the hybrid knowledge base. I mean, this here is the knowledge base. It's not yet the expert system. So we entered rules uh, automatically from the database, and we also entered rules which we got from the human expert. And now, at this point, we get a set of about 500 such probabilistic rules. And of course, this is not enough knowledge. Because in order to solve it exactly, we would need about 3 million such equations. Huh? Um, but we had only 500, but there's no problem if we use Maxent. In Maxent can deal with uh, missing knowledge. So we then apply to this set of rules um, maximum entropy. And what does our maximum entropy do? It completes our probability distribution. We then get a, a full distribution. And so that this means we can answer any query that comes from the physician. Uh, and uh, Maxent then will output a diagnosis. So that's the, the rough model of the system. Of course, now we, uh, next time, we will talk about which of these conditional probabilities do we get from the database or the expert. Okay, thank you.